we're going to be taking some time off this summer. But before we do, we thought it would be a good opportunity to highlight some of our past videos that are just as relevant as when we launched them. Recently, you may have seen a video we made on exercise's positive impact on mental health. We've talked about exercise a lot in this channel, and with the nice weather upon us, at least in much of the United States, we hope this video will help motivate you to get outdoors this summer, move your body however you can. Enjoy, and we'll see you with a new episode soon. This will be at least the third video over Healthcare Triage's lifetime that I have said something on the order of this. Other than smoking, there are few modifiable risk factors that seem to have as much of an impact on health as physical exercise does. We've got good data on how beneficial exercise is for physical health. It improves outcomes for people with osteoarthritis of the knee and rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, and chronic pulmonary obstructive disease, or COPD. Exercise therapy can reduce not just death from cardiac diseases, but death from all causes. And in patients suffering from Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis, exercise improves health-related quality of life measures like physical function. It helps with chronic fatigue, even in individuals suffering from fatigue due to cancer treatments. And then, of course, there's mental health, which gets a huge boost from exercise, and that's what we're zeroing in on for this episode. Looking at the literature, the positive effect of exercise on mental health is pretty clear, but the details are a bit fuzzy. Some data suggest that intensity and type of exercise matter, while other data do not. To examine these questions further, a recent systematic review and meta-analysis has attempted to give us more insights. To the research! Published in February of 2024, the study compared exercise to psychotherapy, antidepressants, and controls as a treatment for major depression. It examined the results of 218 studies with over 14,000 total participants above 18 years of age. When compared to controls like a placebo tablet, exercise resulted in a moderately larger decrease in depression. This held true for walking or jogging, yoga, strength training, and exercise like Tai Chi. But the strongest effects were seen for strength training and yoga. The effects of all exercise were proportional to intensity, meaning the more intense the exercise, the greater the decrease in depression. The antidepressant effects of strength training and cycling appear to be larger for women, while the effects of yoga, tai chi, and aerobic exercise appear to be larger for men. Older participants appeared to benefit more from yoga and aerobic exercise, while younger participants saw more benefit with strength training. The delivery of the exercise may have a small impact as well, with exercise like yoga having greater effects in a group setting and exercises like strength training and mixed aerobics having greater effects in an individual setting. While this held true across people with different health issues and different levels of depression at baseline, it's important to note that many of the studies were judged to have some level of bias, which does lower confidence in the overall conclusions. The bias was largely related to expectancy effects, which were a result of not blinding researchers and participants to the conditions. While all trials examined in this meta-analysis were randomized and controlled, they were not restricted to trials that blinded the conditions. When people participating in an experiment know which group they're in, meaning they're not blinded to whether they're getting the experimental treatment or the placebo, their reports, in this case of depression levels, can change based on what they expect the treatment or placebo to do. And in the case of researchers, what they rate, record, etc., may change for the same reasons if they know which condition their participants are in. Another issue is that not all studies included both men and women, and not all studies included a range of ages, making the conclusions on sex and age harder to pin down with accuracy. However, even given these kinds of limitations, the evidence base for exercise is strong enough overall that we feel comfortable advocating for it as one of the frontline treatments for both physical and mental health. But exercise isn't often viewed as fun by most people. So what does the research say about getting people to exercise? We have a video on that too. You can't outrun your fork, or so they say, which basically means that you can't eat a bunch of junk food, followed by a bunch of exercise, and assume the exercise will make up for the junk food. Variations of this phrase exploded in media headlines last week for coverage of a recently published study on the effects of diet and exercise on mortality risk. Essentially, the media coverage went something like this. According to new study, you need both exercise and a quality diet to live longer. This sounds good. 
and there are little kernels of truth buried in there, but coverage of the study was, as usual, less than appropriate. So we're here to dig a little bit deeper. To the research. The study used data from the UK Biobank, a very large biomedical database that gathered health information from around a half million individuals across the United Kingdom between 2007 and 2010. Specifically, the researchers took one time self-report questionnaires about diet and exercise from this biobank and group people based on their answers, followed by examination of who later died and how. They reported that individuals who exercised more and ate better had the lowest overall risk of mortality, and the lowest risk of mortality related to things like specific cancers and cardiovascular disease. Let's first note that the diet quality questionnaire took into account only three categories of food items, fruit and vegetables, fish, and red and processed meats. This was a blunt measurement, as one author put it, and didn't take into account other food categories like sweetened foods and drinks. This isn't necessarily a deal breaker on its own, but if you want to understand the relationship between diet and health, getting a picture of the whole diet is a good first step. But speaking of getting the whole picture, let's talk about self-reports. This is a common complaint, but worth repeating. The likelihood of people correctly remembering what they've eaten in the past, let alone how many servings of it they ate, is not great. Our memory is worse the further back we try and remember, and the same goes for exercise. It's a tough task to remember that much past information correctly, so studies like these that rely entirely on participants' memories of what they've eaten and how much are hard to draw firm conclusions from. And on top of that, diet and exercise patterns are not fixed throughout people's lifetimes. The particular snapshot captured by a one-time self-report questionnaire isn't likely to be an accurate representation across a long period. Remember also the sheer number of confounders in a data set like this one. People who exercise regularly and eat things like fish and lots of fresh produce tend to have other things in common as well. Things like education, money, and extra time all of which have huge impacts on health. While these factors can be controlled for to some extent with statistics, there are so many variables that the data set often becomes too noisy to hope for picking up reliable signals. And beyond only taking into account those three food categories we mentioned, participants were coded into just three diet quality groups, low, medium, and high quality. High quality diets were characterized as having at least 4.5 cups of fruit and vegetables per day, at least two weekly servings of fish, and less than two weekly servings of processed meats, and less than five weekly servings of red meat per week. I've said a hundred times that the human diet has so many components that it would be nearly impossible to pinpoint a single one as bad or good. In that same vein, distilling any particular human diet down into low, medium, or high quality based on three self-reported factors while specifically leaving other factors like sugar out of the equation just isn't going to cut it. And lastly, the authors report that the association between diet and mortality from all causes and cardiovascular disease was not even significant. Look, we aren't getting down on this particular set of researchers. We've got thousands upon thousands of studies examining diets and exercise and mortality, and they all run into the same problems. We don't really need more of them, and we definitely don't need more non-nuanced media coverage of them. Am I saying fruits and veggies and fish aren't good for you? No! Am I saying that exercise isn't good for you? Absolutely not! Am I saying that red meat isn't necessarily bad for you? Well, actually, yes, but you'll have to go watch that video for more detail. The point is that the evidence doesn't back up these weekly headlines we see about diet, exercise, and mortality studies, this one included. Exercise is tough, and it can be hard to fit into already busy schedules. 2018 report in The Lancet estimated that insufficient physical activity hovered around 27.5% in the global population. This is higher in high-income countries and is increasing. In the United States, just over half of adults meet guidelines for recommended aerobic activity, and just over 20% meet recommendations for both aerobic and strength activity. But exercise is awesome for both physical and mental health. We've done a whole episode on this, and as I said there, 
Other than smoking, there are few modifiable risk factors that seem to have the huge impact on health that physical activity does. We do have data from randomized controlled trials on interventions that increase activity levels. But when you're trying to figure out how one intervention stacks up against another, it can be tricky if separate trials have a bunch of different factors that make them difficult to compare. Enter the mega study, introduced for the first time, as far as we know, in a recent Nature publication. It encompasses several randomized controlled trials, all designed and conducted at the same time. The study compared 53 four-week interventions against a control treatment, all designed to encourage exercise in over 60,000 members of 24-hour fitness, a fitness chain in the United States. The effort was undertaken by 30 scientists from 15 different universities. In the placebo condition, participants received points for enrolling in the study that could be redeemed at Amazon and received no further intervention after that. Given that previous data suggested that exercise success can be better achieved with prompts to plan workouts, reminders, and a small cash rewards, a baseline intervention was also instituted with these three factors, with the rest of the interventions building on that structure. Compared to placebo, 24 of the experimental conditions significantly increased weekly gym visits. The baseline intervention with the planning prompts, reminders, and rewards increased weekly gym visits by 9% overall, and five of the experimental conditions significantly increased exercise above that. In two of those conditions, offering a small reward to return to the gym after missing a workout increased weekly workouts by 12 and 16% overall compared to the baseline intervention. And when I say small reward, I mean small. Participants received 125 or 225 points, which translated to 9 or 16 cents. This makes sense. We know from previous research that very small rewards can change behavior. As I've said many times before, this is why 10 cent coupons are a thing. Interestingly, the 9 cent reward resulted in better outcomes than the 16 cents. In a third condition, offering participants larger incentives than the baseline intervention group for going to the gym, points equaling about a buck 75 per gym visit, increased weekly gym visits by 14% across the condition. In a fourth condition, simply telling participants that the majority of Americans exercise and that that number is increasing up gym visits by 13% compared to the baseline intervention group. And in the fifth condition, letting participants decide whether they would gain points for going to the gym or lose points for not going increased weekly gym visits by 9% compared to the baseline intervention group. Each condition had, at the very least, 455 participants, with the mean number of participants per group being over 1,100. The group percentages we just mentioned for each of those five conditions translated to between 0.28 and 0.4 extra weekly gym visits per participant. Given that lack of physical activity accounts for somewhere around 9% of premature deaths globally, we'd gladly take the improvement. And the study design is exciting. Although likely cumbersome in many ways, including financially, it allows us to compare apples to apples, as the researchers put it. When it comes to stuff like informing health policy, this might be easier than our current approach of comparing piles of apples, oranges, and the occasional prunes. You may have seen news stories this week saying that if you exercise in the morning, you'll lose more weight. Place your bets now to see if I agree. This is Healthcare Triage News. If you bet that I'd agree, you need to watch more Healthcare Triage. To the research. Recent publication in the International Journal of Obesity, The Effects of Exercise Session Timing on Weight Loss and Components of Energy Balance, Midwest Exercise Trial 2. The researchers gathered together something less than 100 overweight or obese, physically inactive young adults and put them in a 10-month supervised exercise program for five days a week. This was an RCT originally, so there were controls who were not assigned to exercise. And obviously, the participants weren't blinded. They knew if they were exercising or not. Those in the intervention group could exercise anytime they wanted from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. on weekdays and shorten hours on Saturday when the university exercise facility was open. And, like you'd expect if you've watched our episodes on exercise and weight loss, they lost less weight than you'd expect given the calorie burn. They also lost wildly different amounts of weight. That's because what you eat tends to matter much more than exercise when it comes to weight loss. That was a previous study, of course. This study was a sub-analysis of the original study. It's not a randomized controlled trial. People were not randomized to time of day exercise. Don't be fooled by reports that got this wrong. In this study, they grouped people by when they tended to exercise. Early people did so before noon. 
Early afternoon went from noon to 3 p.m. Late afternoon went from 3 to 7 p.m. Sporadic people were those where no time period was used more than half the time. There were 21 early people, 11 midday people, 25 late people, and 24 sporadic people. So don't go thinking this trial was huge either. Oh, and the midday group was so small it had to be dropped from the analysis. They found that after 10 months, more people in the early group lost a meaningful amount of weight, 81%, followed by the sporadic group, 54%, followed by the late group, 36%. Before you all go changing your routines, remember that this is not a randomized controlled trial. It's totally possible that there are other differences in people who choose to exercise at different times of the day that matter. In fact, this study found a few differences itself. People in the early exercise group ate more, more than 200 calories each day, than late exercisers did at 10 months. Why? We don't know. People who exercised later in the day tended to be less active overall than those who exercised early in the morning. Why? We don't know. I can guess. Maybe those who exercised earlier had different types of jobs. Maybe they belonged to different socioeconomic classes or something else that also might make a difference. But if I'm being honest, I'm not sure I care to delve into that too much. The differences from person to person are huge. Each line in this figure is a different person. As you can see, most people lost weight. And if you randomly picked a person in any group, you'd still see big differences. And still, we're talking about like 20 people in each group. These are not concrete, randomized controlled trial data that should convince you to change your mind on anything. Now, Eric Willis, one of the researchers, did hedge in a story I saw him quoted in, and I'm quoting him now. Based on this data, I would say that the timing of exercise might, just might, play a role in whether to and to what extent people drop pounds with exercise. I can't stress the might enough. We could do a randomized control trial of this. We could see whether the time of exercise works, but I'm not going to hold my breath because, again, who cares? The purpose of exercise is not to lose weight. It's to get all of the amazing health benefits that come with it, no matter what time you exercise. We have had multiple episodes discussing how diet, not exercise, is the key to a healthy weight. Many of you disagree. You point to evidence, which usually isn't that great. Now it turns out some of it might have been tainted. Recently, over at the BMJ, Paul Thacker, a freelance journalist, published a story on how Coca-Cola was funding a series of journalism conferences covertly. The purpose? To relay the message that exercise is a bigger problem than sugar when it comes to obesity. About two years ago, the New York Times and the AP wrote stories about the Global Energy Balance Network, a collaboration between Coca-Cola and scientists at the University of Colorado to handle the obesity epidemic. The company gave the school $1 million. The coverage didn't sit well with the public, and the whole thing wound up getting shut down. Turns out that, much less publicly, this had been going on for a while, though. Freedom of information laws allowed the BMJ to get documents which showed that Coca-Cola had been funding similar conferences as early as 2011, and they worked. Journalists who attended them left and wrote stories on how exercise mattered, not drinking sugar-sweetened beverages. James Hill, a professor of pediatrics at the University of Colorado and a major recipient of this funding, wrote the company after one of these conferences in 2012 and said, and I'm quoting, the journalist told us that this was an amazing event and they generated a lot of stories. You basically supported the meeting this year. I think we can get many more sponsors involved next year. Coca-Cola sent the school another $45,000 a few months later. The problem is, and it's always this, they weren't transparent. Others, including the National Press Foundation, didn't know about the funding and the conflicts of interest. When a journalist complained and the National Press Foundation asked, a different professor told them that, and I'm quoting again, the funding for this came from our general educational grant resources. No acknowledgement of their conversations with Coca-Cola or their funding. According to the article, Coca-Cola said that in 2015, they did disclose in their website funding for conferences in 2012 after the news stories broke. But this was years later, of course. Given the anger I've received over episodes defending artificial sweeteners, I hope I've established my bona fides as a not enemy of the soda industry. I'm not anti-food companies. Tons of episodes should back that up. But we've also talked about conflicts of interest so many times here, too. You can't hide this stuff. You've got to acknowledge it. All kinds of conflicts. They're important. Clearly, the soda companies have an interest here. It's in, what, the billions of dollars? Spending tens of thousands here and there is nothing to generate positive press. That's what it appears they were doing.